Hello, and welcome to today's TEA Talks session, recorded February 10th, 2015. Today's session is titled, The Subtle Science of Story. TEA Talks are produced by the Themed Entertainment Association's NextGen Committee, which seeks to introduce students and recent graduates to the industry, the TEA, and their own potential as future-themed entertainment dreamers, creators, and doers. My name is Joe Fox, and I am your host for today's session. Today we are joined by three outstanding panelists. Sean McCoy, Vice President of Marketing and Business Development, Jack Rouse Associates, Adam Berger, President and Senior Showwriter for Berger Creative Associates, and David Misch, Showwriter and Really Funny Guy. We hope you enjoy the great content these three have to share, and without further ado, let's hear first from Sean McCoy at JRA. Sean? Thanks everyone for uh, taking a few minutes to discuss one of my favorite topics, which is stories and more specifically the power that stories have to create engaging, memorable experiences. Um, I've had the pleasure to be in the, in the attractions business for a little over 20 years, and over that time I've heard a lot of talk about the use of stories and visitor experiences. However, I have to admit, a lot of the time I really didn't know what the word story meant as it applied to visitor experiences. Um, some of you may feel that way as well, but hopefully you know, in, in about 10 minutes you won't feel that way anymore. Um, to understand how stories can be translated into visitor experiences, you must first understand the, the basic components of a story. Uh, the simplest way uh, to think about story components is to think about the components of a great book. Um, it has a bevy of memorable characters, um, a series of environments, and an interesting narrative that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, and stories have, can have great power over an audience. For example, the stories can make you care, uh, care about characters. As, as a quick test, um, if you had your choice, who would you want to have a beer with? This archaeologist or this archaeologist? Now, I would say most of you would choose the fictional Dr. Jones because you know his. What if I were to tell you that uh, Professor Howard Carter actually discovered King Tut's tomb? you'd probably want to hear that story as well. Um, stories also can make us care more about content, uh, such as artifacts in museums. For example, you probably wouldn't look at this chair for more than two seconds if you saw it in a museum. But when you hear the story that this was the chair that Abraham Lincoln sat upon when he was assassinated, that story makes that chair much more interesting. And that's our job as attraction designers to engage audiences by telling that story in a memorable manner. So how exactly do we do that? Well, luckily we have a number of mediums at our disposal in which to tell stories, um, including themed architecture, environmental graphics, displays, immersive environments, media experiences, rides, and shows. But the question is, uh, you know, of all these tools, uh, do, do they really work together uh, to create memorable guest experiences? Well, let's take a look. Let's take a look at two rides that are pretty much identical except for a layer of story and theme. So for our first non-story-based attraction, we'll look at a generic prop tower. Pretty simple concept. You go up and down and sometimes up and down again. No characters, no environments, no stories. Just thrill, amusement, fun for those 45 seconds or so, but not really memorable beyond that. Now let's take that exact same ride component and overlay engaging environments, characters, a strong storyline, and a bit of intellectual property, and you get one of my favorite attractions of all time, Tower of Terror. The story begins with its haunting architecture and carry, it carries on as you walk through the creepy lobby and then into the library where we hear the stories of those who perished on the doomed elevator. We then make our way to the boiler room and take an elevator where we see the ghosts of those who passed away. Now 
all of this happens, all this buildup happens before the highlight of the ride, which is the tower drop. This attraction points out one of the key factors in telling a good story with an attraction, and that by taking guests through several environments and pre-shows, the story was able to slowly unfold, providing guests with the opportunity to forge an emotional connection for the characters and the underlying narrative. And then the bottom line is you have to provide space and time for stories to evolve and connect with your audience. So again, this base ride is still the same for both of these attractions, but I would propose that the guest experience within Tower of Terror is much richer and much more memorable because of story. Now, as most of you know or are probably aware, intellectual property is very much in demand these days. And when you base an attraction on an existing IP, your audience already has been exposed to and become emotionally attached to your characters, environments, and stories, which makes it easier to immerse them. But do you have to have IP to create a memorable guest experience? I would say that while it's certainly nice to have IP to work with, it's not a necessity. Let's again take a look at two identical rides, one with IP and one without, to see if the use of intellectual property provides a markedly better visitor experience. The first ride is Ratatouille Adventure. It's based upon the popular Pixar movie uh, and opened in Disneyland Paris this past July. During the attraction, guests ride on a trackless ride vehicle and see all of the movie's characters as they ride through the Parisian kitchen featured in the movie and try to evade the evil Chef Skipper. So that's a very quick look at a ride that successfully integrates intellectual property and story. Now Mystic Manor at Hong Kong Disneyland provides a very similar guest experience. Same ride, except this attraction is based upon a new, develop, a new story developed specifically for the attraction. The story begins with the uh, architecture of Mystic Manor, home of Lord Henry Mystic and his pet monkey Albert. In an immersive pre-show, Lord Mystic explains that the house is filled with exhibition rooms and his latest collections. He also mentions an enchanted music box full of rare magic that must be opened with caution. Guests then begin touring the manor, and of course, the monkey Albert opens the box and brings to life everything inside the house. So while this attraction isn't based on an existing IP, I would say that it's every bit as engaging as the Ratatouille ride, given its use of likable characters, magical environments, and an exciting storyline. The best story-based attractions are, are those that engage all of your senses and make you feel as though you're part of the narrative, living it in real life. And my last case study is probably the best recent example of this approach in action, and that's at Universal's Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Since 1997, a variety of memorable characters and magical environments and exciting stories have been described in great detail within seven books and brought to life in eight movies. So audiences have had over 17 years to fall in love with these components, which Universal had to bring to life. And they have done so by using all the techniques we discussed today, themed architecture, immersive environments, uh, media, rides, and shows. And through these techniques, you live the story of Harry Potter. And let's take a look at exactly how we do that. So if you've been there, you can walk through Diagon Alley. You can choose your wand at Ollivander's. You can run through a brick wall to get to platform nine and three quarters. And then take a ride on the Hogwarts Express. And again, we're talking about engaging all of our senses. So you can go uh, and eat at the Leaky Cauldron or you can drink a butterbeer in Hogsmeade. Or, of course, you can purchase a chocolate frog at Honeydukes. You can also explore all the various environments and unleash the magic of your wand. Or see a variety of shows. Before you return to Hogwarts, so you either outmaneuver a dragon or revisit Diagon Alley to escape from Gringotts with Harry, Ron, and Hermione. So why is this such a great experience? Well, because it uses a variety of mediums and techniques to completely immerse guests within a story that once only existed on paper. Which brings us to our final chapter. 
So in summary, you know, the key messages that I think we've learned today is that a good story is comprised of interesting characters, environments, and narratives. Stories have the power to make an audience care about characters and content. To engage your audience in the story-based attraction, you must provide enough time and space for the story to evolve and your guests to care. Intellectual property is certainly nice to have, uh, but when creating an attraction, not required. Guests remember a good story more than a weekly interpreted IP. And finally, the best attractions completely immerse guests in a story, engaging all their senses and making them feel as though they're part of the narrative. Most importantly, stories have the ability to suspend reality for a moment in time and capture our guests' hearts and minds. And that's really an amazing power. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sean. We appreciate you sharing that. And uh, for any of you who've experienced those lands, you know exactly what they mean uh, to the guests who, who see them. It's a chance to live something that they've been passionate about for, like you said, 15, 17 years of their lives. And for many of them, that's their entire life. They've literally grown up alongside these stories. So uh, thank you for sharing those very passionate stories with us. So if you have any questions for any of our presenters today, uh, they're going to be happy to take questions at the end of our session. Uh, just send your questions in through the question uh, function inside GoToWebinar. Um, if you have any problems using the question feature, just feel free to send them through the chat, uh, and I will take them and compile them there. I'd like to introduce Adam Berger from Berger Creative, and he's going to be telling us a little bit about uh, his experiences with story. Uh, Adam? It's, uh, it's your story. Tell us all about it. All right. Thank you, Joe. Uh, as uh, Joe just mentioned, my name is Adam Berger. I'm the president, senior show writer, and chief cook and bottle washer at Berger Creative Associates Incorporated. We're an Orlando-based creative writing and consulting company specializing in themed entertainment and attractions. It's an appropriate career for me since all my life I've been obsessed with theme parks, especially the Disney ones. Over the years, I've had the honor and pleasure of composing theme park and attraction concepts, storylines, and scripts for some of the most creative and respected clients in the country, or I should say in the industry. Along the way, I discovered there are a lot of things that go into becoming a successful attraction show writer. First, you need a solid command of language and a strong grasp of storytelling fundamentals, plus a healthy obsession with theme parks. You also need a strong work ethic and the ability to co collaborate with other creative professionals as well as professionals on the technical side. You should also strive to maintain a positive attitude, be a careful listener, and always, always keep your ego in check. I cannot stress that last part enough. But then I began to realize that there's Another part of the story, an aspect of the profession that you don't usually hear about, but which I'm going to share with you right now. It's a powerful creative tool that the Disney Imagineers have harnessed to design attractions and guest experiences that resonate in your subconscious in ways that you aren't even aware of. It's an idea called mythic storytelling. And though it's often overlooked, I believe it's one of the main reasons why the Disney parks have always been so incredibly popular. If you understand mythic storytelling and you know what to look for, you'll find mythic stories everywhere in the Disney parks. And uh, if you don't understand mythic storytelling and you don't know what to look for, don't panic. All you have to do is read my book, Every Guest is a Hero, Disney's Theme Parks, and the Magic of Mythic Storytelling, which is available in both print and e-reader editions from several fine online booksellers. Hint, hint. Obviously, the book and my presentation to you today focus on the Disney theme parks and the Imagineers who created them, but I think you'll find that the insights and lessons apply to theme parks and attraction designers everywhere. A lot of the book is centered on a theory called the hero's journey, which plays a major role in shaping how we experience the Disney parks. It's a metaphor that describes a journey of transformation shared by everyone everywhere. It resonates with the human psyche because it embodies the transformative events, the challenges, setbacks, and triumphs that we all face in life. We don't have time to go into detail about the hero's journey today, but let me just give you a quick overview. The hero's journey was first identified and described by the late mythologist, author, and lecturer Joseph Campbell. He popularized it through influential books such as The Hero with a Thousand Faces, The Transformations of Myth Through Time, and Myths to Live By. Campbell spent much of his career studying and comparing the myths, legends, folk stories, and fairy tales of cultures around the world, and he came to the realization that they all had certain elements in common. He found that all stories told throughout history and across all cultures are expressions of the hero's journey. 
That's because the hero's journey is really the story of all humans everywhere. Also known as the mythic round, its major movements, separation, descent, ordeal, and return, echo the key transformations in our own lives. Although the journey often takes the protagonist and the audience on a physical adventure, the mythic round is first and foremost an inner journey, a journey of personal transformation in which the hero will be challenged to grow in character, take individual responsibility, and successfully bring together the different elements of his or her personality to become an emotionally complete person. In the words of Star Wars creator George Lucas, quote, Myths help you to have your own hero's journey, find your individuality, find your place in the world. But hopefully they remind you that you're part of a whole and that you must also be part of the community above the welfare of yourself. The hero's journey is at the core of some of the most successful motion pictures of all time, including all of Disney's most popular movies. But the hero's journey can be even more potent when it's presented in the three-dimensional environment of a theme park where the stories surround and engulf you. Today, the hero's journey forms the narrative foundation of every Disney theme park everywhere in the world and all the experiences within them. By harnessing the magic of mythic storytelling in general and the hero's journey in particular, the Imagineers who design those parks and attractions are able to emotionally connect with their guests in ways both sublime and profound, enticing them to return again and again. Walt Disney's first theme park, Disneyland, arose out of his use of what Joseph Campbell called creative mythology. Campbell coined the term to describe how an artist processes his or her individual life experiences to communicate a metaphor, a modern myth that has meaning and value for contemporary audiences in the same way that the myths of ancient times spoke to people in an earlier age. For anyone familiar with Walt's life story, it's easy to find examples of creative mythology throughout Disneyland, from the uh, Marceline, Missouri streetscape of Walt's youth, idealized as Main Street USA, to the space age wonders of Tomorrowland, which embody his enduring fascination with technology and the future. Now, uh, you just heard me use the term modern myth, so let me clarify. When I talk about modern myths, I'm not talking about stories of alligators prowling New York City's sewer system or the so-called chupacabra. In fact, modern myths are a different sort of animal entirely. As Joseph Campbell noted, quote, myths offer life models, but the models have to be appropriate to the time in which you are living, which is to say, myths have to reflect the culture, values, period, and location of the people telling them and their audiences. So when we talk about modern myths, we're talking about myths that speak specifically to the requirements of people living today. Modern myths enable those ancient stories to activate the same emotional centers that classic myths activated in the minds of our ancestors. So let's see what sort of modern myths we can find in the Disney parks. Come on, it'll be fun. Uh, one set of modern myths you find in pretty much all of the, of the uh, Magic Kingdom class parks revolves around the romance and legends of the Old West. I'm talking, of course, about Frontierland in Disney's U.S. parks and its counterparts in their parks overseas. Disney's versions of the mythic American frontier focus on the spirits of opportunity and optimism that informed Walt's own life and career. There's an element of the Wild West here, embodied by the rip-roar and thrills of Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, but for the most part, the emphasis is on the inroads of, that civilization has made into the wilderness. So you'll find that the Frontierland streetscape typically features such civilizing influences as a music hall, a train depot, a mercantile shop, and other emblems of a cultivated community overtaking the lawlessness of a slightly earlier time. In this respect, Frontierland metaphorically reminds us of our own ability to tame our most destructive negative impulses in order to assert our better, nobler selves a personal transformation that's at the heart of the hero's journey. Next we have the modern myth of Hollywood and the glitz and glamour of show business. The theme shares several of the ideals that are bound up in the mythology of the American frontier. Like the Old West, the success of the movie industry depended on hardy pioneers who blazed new trails into unknown territories seeking the freedom to pursue their dreams. There they developed new technologies and new approaches to filmmaking. The art and technology of screen animation developed simultaneously with live action filmmaking with Walt Disney and his animators on the leading edge. In fact, the archetypal Hollywood success story of a naive, starry-eyed youngster from the Midwest who journeys to Tinseltown, arriving virtually penniless but destined to make a big splash in showbiz, matches Walt's own early bio. So it's hardly surprising that in the 
Disney theme parks, a lot of real estate is dedicated to the themes of Hollywood and movie making as backdrops for mythic storytelling. Currently, those themes are at the heart of two entire Disney parks in Florida and in Disneyland Paris. Disney California Adventure, meanwhile, includes Hollywood Land, a major park zone devoted to the theme. Within their, within their uh, collective special worlds, you'll find a variety of environments and attractions that immerse you in the Hollywood myth, from the great movie ride and Muppet Vision 3D to rock and roller coaster and lights, motors, action, extreme stunt show. Now, how about technology and the space age? Is that a modern myth? Oh, yeah. In fact, uh, Tomorrowland continues to serve as one of Disney's most compelling expressions of the space age as a context for modern myth-making. It also reflects Walt's personal fascination with the future of mankind and technology. Tomorrowland and its overseas counterparts focus not just on space exploration, but also encompass other topics of scientific investigation, with uh, many of them zooming off into out-and-out -out science fiction. But when it comes to futurism, it's the theme of space exploration that has most dominated the Disney parks, from Space Mountain to Buzz Lightyear Astro Blasters. Part of this may have to do with a shared yearning to push out against the proverbial final frontier, but another aspect of the subject's appeal may be the opportunity it gives us to gain a new understanding of humanity's place in the universe. Which brings us to yet another modernly mythic setting, computers, cyberspace, the Internet, and the information superhighway. Electronic technology was already part of the Tomorrowland mix when Walt Disney opened his Carousel of Progress attraction at Disneyland following its much acclaimed debut at the 1964-65 New York World's Fair. Today, in its current home in the Magic Kingdom, the show still celebrates a century of technological advances as seen through the eyes of an audio-animatronic family. The digital technology theme is especially at home in the Future World section of Epcot, where you'll find attractions such as Innoventions and Spaceship Earth. But it is Test Track, presented by Chevrolet, that truly immerses you in the digital world as you design your own custom concept vehicle and then performance test it in the glowing, pulsating, cybernetic environment of the SimTrack. All these experiences contribute to Disney's modern myths, which in turn create the context that makes your theme park adventures feel meaningful and emotionally satisfying. For even though the stories being told may date back to the dawn of civilization, by reframing them as tales of the Old West, or Hollywood, or outer space, or cyberspace, the Imagineers are able to give Disney's most popular attractions a deeply resonant sense of immediacy and relevance. So that was a small sample of the Imagineering storytelling secrets you'll find in Every Guest is a Hero. Best of all, these storytelling techniques don't just apply to Disney. In fact, you, too, can harness the power of mythic storytelling to help the theme park experiences you design resonate psychologically with your audience. So if you're an aspiring Imagineer or you know someone who's pursuing a career in attraction design, this really is a must-read volume. Of course, I might be just a little bit biased. Um, in any case, thank you for listening, and I will look forward to your questions at the end of the webinar. Thank you very much, Adam. Appreciate you sharing your story with us. Uh, a reminder that if you're interested in asking Adam or John or David a question, that you are welcome to submit that to us, and uh, we would love to see your questions come in and, and to find out more about uh, the stories. So we've talked a little bit about story. We've talked a little bit about some of the the amazing stories that we experience here in the Themed Entertainment Association. Uh, but one of the things we haven't talked about yet is is being funny, because. There's a science to being funny, and uh, there's a really funny guy on the line with us who knows more about that than just about anyone else I know, uh, and that is David Mish. Uh, so I'm getting ready to introduce this young man, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, he's on the line and ready to, to share his bit on uh, how to make things funny and, and how to do that in a scientific, very functional way. Um. There was a reference to the science of comedy. I wouldn't go quite that far. There's a lot of um, stuff one uh, if that is helpful for one to know if one is uh, creating comedy, and I'm going to go through some of that. But, uh, you know, even science is not a science. Uh, all science is art. I'm married to a doctor, and I uh, learned long ago that guesswork, instinct, and gut plays a huge role in everything. But that doesn't mean you, got to, you can't know how proteins work. So uh, I'll show you the proteins in, in some of comedy. I teach a course on how comedy works, uh, which is 45 hours long, 
but there's a lot of filler, so I should be able to cut it down in 10 or 15. Comedy works by four basic principles, pattern recognition, misdirection, tension and resolution, and surprise. But that's actually the principles for all art forms. Comedy is not special in that way. In fact, comedy is not special in most ways. It's very difficult to exactly say how something is funny rather than not. Uh, but comedy does have rules. Uh, now, you may say rules are made to be broken, but that's not true. Rules are made to be followed, and the rules of comedy should be followed when you're starting out. The idea is to learn the rules, then as you get better, break them in creative, unusual ways that express your particular comic point of view. So what are these rules? Keeping in mind, I now have, you know, nine or 14 minutes, depending on how you count. The most famous is the rule of three, which goes back to ancient Rome. Omnitrium perfectum. Everything that comes in threes is perfect. <coughs> Excuse me. So why is the third time the charm? Contemporary philosopher Edward de Bono says the first two variations of the story evoke a pattern in the brain, thus priming it for the punchline, which breaks the pattern. That pattern break, that sudden shift in perspective, is a surprise. And that's what makes the funny. How is it important is surprise and humor? Everyone's first comedy routine is peekaboo. But the principle of surprise is used by all kinds of disciplines. In any horror movie, the basic pattern is attractive, scantily clad young woman enters a dark room, looks left, pattern introduced, looks right, pattern established, and seeing fine with knife, leaps from behind, pattern disrupted along with jugular vein. Comedy is so specific that there are rules about single letters. One is that hard consonants like K <coughs> excuse me, and P and sibilants like S especially used alliteratively, are funnier than soft consonants. A boot in the behind is not as funny as a kick in the pants. Experiments have shown that the funniest animal to use in a joke is a duck. Now, why would that be? Think about duck. It's a single syllable. There's a K at the end, and it rhymes with a dirty word. Also, ducks look funny, which is, I know, a bit duckist, but uh, let's move on from that. Those hard consonants are like a period at the end of the sentence, or especially with a punchline, an explanation point. That strong, sharp, solid sound provides a signal that says, that's the end. A cue that this is the moment to laugh. It says, that's all, folks. Of course, you can't put a hard consonant at the end of a Hamlet soliloquy and get a laugh. I believe that to understand comedy, you have to define how it's different from drama. Now, it seems obvious, and for the ancient Greeks, it was. Comedy ended with a wedding, tragedy with a funeral. Although, remember, you can't spell funeral without fun. But is it that simple? A great man once said, there is no principle of comedy which doesn't also apply to drama. And I agree with me. Pattern recognition, misdirection, tension and resolution, surprise, as I said, those are the basic components of not just comedy, not just drama, but every art form, from painting to music to dance. Obviously, comedy is different than drama, but how? 50s comedian Jerry Lewis said, comedy is a man in trouble. So drama is about people doing really well. <clears throat> Someone in a tough situation, frustrated they can't get what they want, that isn't comedy or drama. It's plot. A person in some kind of trouble is the foundation of every story ever told. Fiction is friction. So what's the secret ingredient that makes comedy? Here's an interesting quote. Life is a tragedy in close-up. I'm sorry, life is a tragedy in close-up but a comedy and long shot. What do you think that means? Here's another quote that will sort of amplify it, uh, a very famous one, comedy equals tragedy plus time, which is, I think, a version of the same thing if you consider time a form of distance. And Mel Brooks's famous dictum, tragedy is when I cut my finger, comedy is when you fall into an open sewer and die, is also about distance. It's funny when it happens away from me, not to me. Most physical comedy seems to be done with long or medium shots. Why? One reason is so you can clearly see the bodies doing painful, funky things. But another is that when you see those figures getting squeezed, punched, kicked from a distance, they're funny. Up close, we hear the cries of pain, see the bruises, the blood, the tangible toll on the fragile flesh. Just like your mom said, it's only funny until someone gets hurt. There's a strange laugh in Terminator 2, where the Terminator promises a kid he won't kill anyone. Later, hundreds of cops surround Arnold Schwarzenegger, who's pretty much helpless, armed with nothing but his invulnerability and a two-billion-round automatic weapon. 
And he lets fly and shoots all the cops in the lake. And the audience laughs, because he's keeping his promise to the kid. He's not killing the cops, just horribly wounding the thing. I have this weird fantasy of making a movie where we follow one of those anonymous cops through the hospital, through years of rehab, his marriage falls apart, he has a nerve breakdown. The only way those wounded cops can be funny is to not have those thoughts, to watch in long shot, with what French philosopher Henri Bergson called a momentary anesthesia of the heart. The implication of the idea of distance is that seeing things up close, seeing them as they really are, inevitably means tragedy rather than comedy. But I'm not sure I agree with that. All the great comedians talk about comedy being a form of truth, and intimate moments are often the funniest. Steve Carell says, a person in a comedy doesn't know he's in a comedy. I agree. The character should never know. But the actor or writer or director must always know that they're responsible for planting the comedy cues that tell the audience to laugh and not cry. The actor, writer, director, set designer, wardrobe, everyone works together to say this is meant to be funny essentially giving us permission to laugh at something that just could as easily be seen as tragic. Husband brings a boss home for dinner, wife burns the roast. Funny if Lucille Ball does it in a sitcom, but in a drama about a couple in a desperate financial situation, it's tragic. But we're talking about relatively subtle, emotionally complex situations. There's nothing ambiguous about something as blunt and brutal as physical pain. Someone getting horribly burned or stabbed in the eye, you can't put a comic spin on that. But you so can. Everyone from the Three Stooges to the Hangover movies use people in tremendous physical pain to get laughs. Why does that work? In the Three Stooges, you might see a man scalded with a blowtorch and another gouged in the eye with a steel spike. There's actually a Three Stooges short called They Stooge to Conquer, which has that. And I normally show it at this point. Anyway, that little clip gets laughs from people who aren't 12-year-old boys. So why would that be? Is it the cartoonish reactions? But cartoonish usually means bigger, broader, and their actions are actually smaller. Mo gets stabbed in the eye and goes, ow. <coughs> Excuse me. In real life, a steel spike through your eye would probably produce more than ow. By Mo not reacting with howls of anguish or spurting blood, the audience is cued to laugh rather than, say, vomit. There's other things to, at work, too, but I need another 44 hours and 41 minutes to discuss them, so here's just one. Many of you may remember the scene in Bridesmaids where Melissa McCarthy sits in a sink. She's in pain, right? So why are we laughing? Two reasons, I think. French philosopher Henri Bergson said people are funny when they act like uh, machines, but also when they act like animals, when our bodies are unfettered, every kind of cation from dafta to fournier. Lots of comedy is based on animalistic functions like sex, eating, and going to the bathroom, hopefully not at the same time. Also, we're not actually laughing at Melissa McCarthy. She's not in trouble. She's earning a very good living. We laugh at something we know isn't real, but we identify with the situation and the character's responses. Someday the saying goes, we'll look back on this and laugh. We remember the delightful horror, the agonizing hilarity of our own humiliations. Really, we're laughing at ourselves which is the opposite of cruelty, it's empathy. So I think there's no difference between the mechanics of, me of comedy and the mechanics of drama. The secret of comedy is attitude, emphasis, cues. It's the attitude, not the content, the seasoning, not the meat, that makes something funny or sad. And the wax philosophic for a second, that applies to humanity. People have high ideals and usually fail to achieve them. Is that funny or tragic? Point of phrase, all depends how you look at it. That's it for me. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I told you guys, he's a very, very funny guy, and we're very glad to have him here with us today. So uh, if you have a question for David or for any of our panelists, uh, please go ahead and take this opportunity to, uh, to send that in to us. I've got a couple of questions here, and I, I just have to share this picture because, uh, like you said, it's all the timing. So. <laughs> you know, I was younger. I believed in faithful hair then. <laughs> All right, so our first question today comes from Michelle, and uh, Michelle asks, Adam, do you see the modern myths as stable, but being used in new ways, or are new myths emerging? That's a very perceptive question, Michelle, and uh, I, I would have to say that uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, both, both things are true. Uh, the, 
I, I don't know if the term myths are stable, really. Uh, uh, I, I would say that the myths are always uh, changing because people are always changing, and that's where myths emerge from. It's from our own subconscious. Uh, a lot of this has to do with theories of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, Sigmund Freud and of uh, Carl Jung. But uh, the idea is that myths are uh, originate in our unconsciousness, and they emerge through our dreams and through our uh, through our imagination, through art, through storytelling, and uh, and they're always going to be adapted to whatever the uh, our, our personal situation is, uh, including the society we live in, uh, our, our, uh, our the culture, and and uh, any sort of events that that may be unfolding around us. So if you look at Star Wars, for instance, that was very much a movie tied in with the, the end of the Vietnam War and uh, a, a lot of the things that were going on in uh, civil society at the time that George Lucas was making that movie. So uh, I think uh, new myths are always being made, but they're always going to have their roots in the, the classic myths because the classic myths, uh, just like the modern myths, have their roots in, uh, in uh, people's experiences and, uh, and their subconscious. Excellent. Thank you. We've got a question for Sean. Sean David asks, when writing a story for a large segment of the public, are there specific methods to appease or speak to a multitude of age groups? Do you try to write for everyone at once, or do you target various age groups with different parts of the story? Um, I think the, the answer is yes to, to both uh, questions. I, I think you try to uh, speak to everyone at once with a very simple overlay of a story or a premise. Um, and then throughout the attraction, you certainly cater experiences that will uh, appeal to certain age groups. Um, the best experiences, I think, are those that, that work uh, with the same medium to multi multiple levels, if you will. To put it more plain plainly, think of The Simpsons, that it's funny for kids and it's funny for adults, using the same language, same uh, plot premises, if you will, but it's just really written in a very... Um, just a, a, a very nice fashion. Can I, can I jump in for one sec? Absolutely. <laughs> sure. Um, so, yeah, I totally agree. I was just reading a review of a, a new animated movie, and it referred to the, quote, familiar, because it's been going on for a few years now, double-track uh, nature of animated contemporary animated movies ostensibly for children, which is that, I mean, it's just what you say. It's true. But there also are, I think, some gags, some humor elements of most contemporary animated movies, which very deliberately appeal specifically to the parents in the audience. Now, the, when I was working on an adult animated show um, uh, uh, for TV, we had what we call five percenter jokes, which were jokes that we knew would only be gotten by five percent of the audience. We put them in mostly to please ourselves and to get the hip, cool people in the audience uh, continue to be interested in the show. But the key is that you can't do it in some sort of blunt way that allows the 95% the of it just be sitting there bored for that section of time. So what we did and what all contemporary animated movies do make, is make sure those things are either buried in something that's funny in and of itself or that goes by very quickly in a flurry of other things. So I think you can target specific elements of the audience at certain times, but uh, you can't do it too much, and uh, most of it's got to get everything. Thank you very much. That was a great, uh, great addition. Uh, I've definitely seen that trend where the the second track is designed to reach that target audience, and you go, "Oh, I get that," and everybody else around you is going, "Huh? I don't get it." So, uh, I've got a question from M. K. Haley uh, for Adam. Adam, do the hero's journey or rule of three models work globally, or is that more specific to a specific style of story? Okay. Uh, well. I, I would say that the hero's journey, uh, you know, pretty much by definition, is universal. That, you know, since um, most humans develop along the same lines, you know, we're born, we uh, we're dependent on our parents for a number of years, but we uh, gradually separate from them and, and establish our own identity, our own sense of independence, and then we go off on our own adventures, and eventually we become the caretakers of our own children if we have them, or we become uh, responsible to our larger community. You know, th those are experiences that all people around the world share, unless you happen to grow up inside a locked in a closet somewhere. But uh, uh, so I, I think it is a universal, but it's always going to be adapted 
to whatever. I, and this, is, this ties in with the, my answer to the previous question. Uh, it's always going to be adapted to whatever your your society, your culture, your your your, uh, your, your uh, personal situation is. So uh, you know, you're going to find certain commonalities uh, in in the stories and folklore and myths and, and legends of. of uh, people around the world, but they're always going to be adapted to their particular situations. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I've got a question here for David. David, the uh, question for you is, have you seen any really good examples of, uh, of comedy translated into three-dimensional environment like a theme park or uh, another themed entertainment style location based experience that, that you can think of that would make a good example. 2D, you know, TV, movies, it, it's been done, but what about 3D? Stepping into the real world. Uh, the, the quickest answer is no, because I really, <laughs> this may be slightly embarrassing in this context, but I don't really go to theme parks much. I, uh, my daughter is 25, and, uh, and although she, she still would like to go from time to time, but hasn't for a while. And uh, probably she wouldn't want me to accompany her. <coughs> but um, I'm aware of some. Obviously, The Simpsons has a ride. I can't remember where. Maybe Disneyland. And uh, I know The Simpsons writers, their actual writers, work on The Simpsons is this giant empire, and they have so many tendrils that not the that many of those tendrils are not tended to by the actual uh, writers of The Simpsons, like The Simpsons cartoon books are written by uh, higher people. Not to say they're not great, but they're not the same people who are actually putting together the show. Uh, but I believe that theme park ride was done by them and therefore was funny. But I know um, a, a number of rides I've been on have humor in many ways. One of the main elements of humor, and this is a talk I gave at the, the tea conference a, a year ago, is the conflation of humor and horror. Because the two emotions, and much too much to get into very quickly now, but the two emotions are very much related, and they're related uh, by the basis of that one word I used before, surprise. Surprise can make you terrified, surprise can make you laugh, and sometimes surprise can do both. Uh, back in the 40s and 50s, there were what we call scare comedies. Bob Hope made them, Abbott and Costello made them, and nowadays we still have things like that. My favorite, it's not contemporary anymore, but Shaun of the Dead from about, what, seven, eight, nine years ago? Unbelievably funny, unbelievably scary. Uh, so uh, I think you don't need to have a comedy ride. I think many rides have comedy woven into them, especially especially in the surprise area. Excellent example. So, Sean, we've got a question for you. What would it take to shift the pendulum from the pursuit of attractions built on existing IP versus new IP, and do you see that pendulum ever doing that shift, or is that are we uh, stuck in an IP mostly mode? Well, I think, I think right now what you have to understand is that a lot of rides are based upon IP because a lot of the rides that we think about are at the Disney's and the Universal's of the world, which are, are those theme parks are owned by conglomerates that have bigger business goals, meaning that they are going to tie their rides to their movies um, and their IP um, as part of a, a global platform, if you will. Um, I think that... What you, if you see more independent theme parks or attractions, you know that's where you're going to get more of these kind of uh, independent storytelling. Um, and I think you see that a lot more in in, in Europe. Some of the newer, uh, smaller attractions um, where they're they're creating their own attractions based on their own stories. To that point, uh, Brandon asks, are living movies becoming the future of big-name theme parks? Is that uh, something we're going to continue to see, or is that something that uh, you know, happened because we had this gigantic world of the, the Harry Potters and, and the Avatars? Or, is that something we're going to continue to see? And that's for any of you. Well, this is Adam. I, I think we're going to continue to see them as long as they're profitable. <laughs> they seem to be very profitable now. I think that's an excellent answer, and, and one that uh, is very important for folks who are just coming into the industry to understand is that uh, one of the things that we do is we get to tell stories, we get to have fun for a living, but at the end of the day, we have to remember that we still have to make a profit. We still have to get people in the park and, and have them buy things and spend money on drinks and merchandise and other stuff. So turning an IP into a profitable theme park attraction is part of the business of being in this business. So. 
Um, with the rise of interactive rides, such as Midway Mania, Astro Blasters, how do you see those changing storytelling attractions, asks Anisha. Well, I mean, that's, that's an example of, of one of the principles that we talked about earlier, which is basically putting the guest into the narrative and, and more of a first-person viewpoint rather than a passive viewpoint. And, you know, we just had a meeting this morning about an attraction that we're designing, and that's what our, our client is asking for, that because guests are used to this kind of mass customization, if you will, and, and they realize they, they want that same level of personalization in a theme park environment. So I think that's going to continue to grow, and I think that we're looking for new methods to, to accomplish that. Excellent. Uh, David, this is a question I hate to even ask you because I, I'm pretty sure it's never happened, but if you've ever told a joke that didn't land, uh, have you ever discovered the root problem behind that and figured out how you could retell the joke and make it work? Yeah, this is something I've done a lot of research on because, as you say, it's never happened to me, but I've interviewed many, many people. Oddly, oddly enough, all the comedy people I've spoken to, it's never happened to them either. Weird. <laughs> yeah, um, no, it happens all the time. And actually, I was just talking to a bunch of comedians. Uh, I was doing a little seminar, and we were talking about <clears throat> this, but the answer is very straightforward. No one has any damn idea. It's so mysterious. Uh, uh, there are uh, people who have speculated about you know, audiences, time of night, time of day. Uh, it's, it's really mysterious, and what's especially mysterious and frustrating is that something you know works, something that has gotten a laugh a thousand times before, will not work on um, you know, one night and one go-through. It can do, you know, it can have to do with the comic and what he or she has been feeling recently, uh, what's in their mind subconsciously when they speak, and how drunk the audience is or not. So there's no really good answer. Um, but like everything in art, it's a game of percentages. You know, there are theme park rides that are absolutely boppo, and some will go on and say, eh, nothing. So you can't predict it, but you you got to have a high percentage. And the comedians who are successful, <coughs> excuse me, in the comedy lines and stories that are successful are ones that hit a high percentage of time. But there's, again, it's it's an art, not a science. So you, you just can't know, and there's no clear answer. I'll give you just one quick example of a, a line I did for many years when I was a stand-up that always got a laugh, and then it stopped getting a laugh, and it never got a laugh again, and I dropped it. And my friend said, you know, I think you're doing it differently. I think it's so it's so in your head, you're just not saying it naturally. So over-familiarity may, may be an issue. Uh, that doesn't uh, uh, necessarily uh, work for all circumstances, but when you're doing it, or maybe when you're experiencing it, having spoken it or heard it a bunch of times may interfere with the enjoyment. Well, and to that point, Sylvia asks a great follow-up question. Is there a key to making a story or a joke or a, a bit endure for years and years? Some stories come and some stories go, but others stay around for a long time. Is there a science to that? Is there a secret sauce? Well, like so much of stand-up comedy, I think it relates to Joseph Campbell. Uh, <laughs> Tapping into universal themes is always great. You know, it, on the one hand, there's Jerry Seinfeld who says, you know, soap? What is it about soap? You know, and so we've all had soap. But then uh, Steve Martin used to have a, a bit where he said, you know how it is when someone wakes you up with a phone call and you pick up the phone and say, is that my defibrillator? And, of course, the joke there is that nobody says that. So he was making fun of the idea that you have to be universal in comedy, but just like with uh, uh, universal myths, I mean, it's got to be universal and specific at the same time. And finding that that uh, sweet spot is something uh, anyone finds out how to do. I will pay you ten dollars if you send me the, the answer to that. Uh, it's just a matter of um, figuring out, you know, something that. Uh, really, I was going to say figuring out something that's funny for people, but that's not true. You have to, for comedy, and I think for myth-making and ride-making, figure out something that's cool for you, and the amount in which your particular psyche taps into the, the widespread psyche is going to be the degree to which it's comfortable, and you can see that. Go on YouTube, look at, you know, 100 comedians, and some are going to say things that are, you know, true of their dating lives that hit hard and hit funny, and others are not, and uh, again, one thing is that uh, you just got to keep cranking out the material. You've got to keep doing things 
and gradually you'll get a better sense of what really hits. And, and tying in with what David just said, sort of on, on the negative side of that, I, I, I would add that uh, one thing to avoid very much is uh, topical humor. Uh, you know, like catchphrases, for instance. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a few years ago, it might have been funny at some point to jump in with, uh, uh, "Can you hear me now?" And a few years earlier, <laughs> something like, uh, um, "I can't believe I oh, I can't believe I ate the whole thing." You know, yeah. That, those would have been funny in the, in context, but if you try to put, slip them into a, a, t, a, a TV show now, you know it's, it's not going to be funny a few years from now. It's certainly not in a theme park attraction. Yeah, topicality is absolutely critical to being long lasting, i.e., no topicality. <laughs> well, we've got consensus on that one. All right, that brings us to the end of our hour. Uh, I want to thank all of our presenters today for taking the time to be with us. Uh, thank you for answering the questions and for being very honest about the work you do and telling us uh, the art and the science of stories and, and comedy. So um, we are going to have another session coming up in March for our TEA talk session. It is titled Cultivating Collaboration project processes and tools. It's a little bit more of a pragmatic approach to how do we do this stuff that we do. Uh, and it's uh, it's going to be a very good session. So tune in and look for that. It's going to be on March 24th. And then our April session that we're looking forward to is going to be kind of the flip side of this coin, where this is the subtle science of story. We're going to talk about the exacting art of architecture. So uh, look forward for that one as well. So we thank all of you for attending. Thank you to our panelists. And you guys have a great day. Thank you for attending today's webinar. For more information about the TEA, please log on to our website at teaconnect.org.